Welcome to the Thornwillow Centennial Reading of Ulysses. We are celebrating James Joyce's literary masterpiece by presenting the entire novel through a tapestry of hundreds of video clips that unite readers across the world. Thank you for joining us. And now continuing episode 18, Penelope, with Ellen Adair, reading from New York. Hi, my name is Ellen Adair, and on the previous occasion when I read from the Oxen of the Sun chapter, I introduced a couple of the editions of Ulysses that I have. They're not fancy, they're just meaningful to me, and also my James Joyce shirt. But I thought, on this occasion, I might introduce to you a couple of wall hangings. One of them is art, the other one is not. I'll just get right to it. This is not art. This is printed from just the computer. Uh, I think it might have been that I printed it at my first job after college. So this has been in every single apartment that I have had since I graduated from college. And uh, yes, I just love how confident he looks in this picture. And I also have this is the actual piece of art. My husband commissioned this from the artist Brandon Bird. Astonishing. Uh, we are also baseball fans, so that's part of the reason for this particular absolutely just genius mashup, but it's the best thing I've ever seen. So I just thought I'd share those things. Malvi's was the first. When I was in bed that morning, and Mrs. Rubio brought it in with the coffee, she stood there standing when I asked her to hand me, and I pointing at them, I couldn't think of the word, a hairpin to open it with, a orquilla, disobliging old thing, and it's staring her in the face with her switch of false hair on her and vain about her appearance, ugly as she was, near 80 or 100, her face a mass of wrinkles with all her religion domineering because she could never get over the Atlantic fleet coming in, half the ships of the world in the Union Jack flying with all her carabineros, because four drunken English sailors took all the rock from them, and because I didn't run into mass often enough in Santa Maria to please her, with her shawl up on her, except when there was a marriage on, with all her miracles of the saints and her black blessed virgin with the silver dress and the sun dancing three times on Easter Sunday morning, and when the priest was going by with the bell, bringing the Vatican to the dying, Blessing herself for his majesty. An admirer, he signed it. I near jumped out of my skin. I wanted to pick him up when I saw him following me along the Calle Real in the shop window. Then he tipped me, just in passing. But I never thought he'd write, making an appointment. I had it inside my petticoat bodice all day, reading it up in every hole and corner while father was up at the drill instructing to find out by the handwriting or the language of stamps. Singing, I remember. Shall I wear a white rose? And I wanted to put on the old stupid clock to near the time. He was the first man kissed me under the Moorish wall. My sweetheart, when a boy. It never entered my head what kissing meant until he put his tongue in my mouth. His mouth was sweet-like, young. I put my knee up to him a few times to learn the way. How what did I tell him? I was engaged, for fun, to the son of a Spanish nobleman named Don Miguel de la Flora. And he believed me that I was to be married to him in three years' time. <gasps> There's many a true word that's spoken in jest. There is a flower that bloometh. A few things I told him true about myself, just for him to be imagining. The Spanish girls he didn't like. I suppose one of them wouldn't have him. I got him excited. He crushed all the flowers on my bosom he brought me. He couldn't count the pesetas and the perigordas till I taught him. Capoquin. He came from, he said, on the black water, but it was too short. Then, the day before he left, May? Yes, it was May, when the infant king of Spain was born. Ah, oh, I'm always like that in the spring. I like a new fella every year. 
up on the tip top under the rock on near O'Hara's tower I told him it was struck by lightning and all about the old Barbary apes they sent to clap him without a tail careering all over the show on each other's back Mrs. Rubio said she was a regular old rock scorpion robbing the chicken out of Ince's farm and throw stones at you if you went near he was looking at me I had that white blouse on open in the front to encourage him as much as I could without too openly they were just beginning to be plump. I said I was tired. We lay over the fir tree cove, a wild place. I suppose it must be the highest rock in existence, the galleries and casemates and those frightful rocks and St. Michael's Cave with the icicles or whatever they call them hanging down and ladders, all the mud, plotching my boots. I'm sure that's the way down. The monkeys go under the sea to Africa when they die. The ships far out, like chips. Ah, oh, that was the Malta boat passing. The sea and the sky. You could do what you liked. Lie there, forever. He caressed them, outside. They love doing that. It's the roundness there. I was leaning over him with my white rice straw hat to take the newness out of it, the left side of my face the best. My blouse open for his last day. Transparent kind of shirt he had. I could see his chest, pink. He wanted to touch mine with his for a moment, but I wouldn't let him. Oh, he was awfully put out. But at first for fear, you never know consumption or leave me with a child embarazada. That old servant Inez told me that one drop of it even, if it got into you, at all. After, I tried with the banana. But I was afraid that it might break and get lost up in me somewhere because they once took something down out of a woman that was up there for years covered with lime salts. They're all mad to get in there where they come out of. You think they could never get far enough up? And then they're done with you. In a way. Till the next time. Yes, because there's a wonderful feeling there. So tender, all the time. Hmm. How did we finish it off? Yes, oh, yes, I pulled them off into my handkerchief. Pretending not to be excited, but I opened my legs. I wouldn't let him touch me inside my petticoat because I had a skirt opening up the side. I tormented the life out of him, first tickling him. I loved rousing that dog in the hotel. Urst, a walk, a walk, a walk. His eyes shut and a bird flying below us. He was shy. All the same, I liked him like that, moaning. I made him blush a little when I got over him that way, when I unbuttoned him and took his out and drew back the skin. It had a kind of an eye in it. They're all buttons, man, down the middle, on the wrong side of them. Molly, darling, he called me. What was his name? Jack? Joe? Mm. Harry? Mulvey? Was it? Yes! I think. Mm. A lieutenant. He was rather fair. He had a laughing kind of a voice. So I went round to the... What do you call it? <laughs> Everything was... Uh, what do you call it? Mustache had he. He said he'd come back. Lord, it's just like yesterday. And if I was married, he'd do it to me. And I promised him, yes, faithfully, I'd let him block me. Now flying. Perhaps he's dead. Or killed. Or a captain. Or an admiral. It's nearly twenty years. If I said Fir Tree Cove, he would. If he came up behind me and put his hands over my eyes to guess who, I might recognize him. He's young still, about 40. Perhaps he's married some girl in the Blackwater and is quite changed. They all do. They haven't half the character a woman has. She little knows what I did with her beloved husband before he ever dreamt of her. In broad daylight, too. In the sight of the whole world, you might say. <laughs> they could have put an article about it in the Chronicle. I was a bit wild after. When I blew out the old bag, the biscuits were Finrum Banati Brothers and exploded it.
Lord, what a bang! All the woodcocks and pigeons screaming, coming back the same way we went over Middle Hill round by the old guard house and the Jews' burial place, pretending to read out the Hebrew on them. I wanted to fire his pistol. He said he hadn't one. He didn't know what to make of me, with his pea cap on, that he always wore crooked as often as I settled it straight. HMS Calypso. Swinging my hat. That old bishop that spoke off the altar his long preach about women's higher functions, about girls now riding the bicycle and wearing pea caps and the new woman bloomers. God send him sense and me more money. I suppose they're called after him. <laughs> I never thought that would be my name, Bloom. When I used to write it in print to see how it looked on a visiting card or practicing for the butcher and oblige M. Bloom. You're looking blooming, Josie used to say to me after I married him. Well, it's better than Breen or Briggs. Does Brig. Or those awful names with the bottom in them. Mrs. Ram's bottom or some other kind of a bottom. Mulvey I wouldn't go mad about either. Or suppose I divorced him. Mrs. Boylan. My mother, whoever she was, might have given me a nicer name, the Lord knows, after the lovely one she had, Lunita Laredo. Oh. The fun we had. Running along Willis Road to Europa Point, twisting in and out all round the other side of Jersey, they were shaking and dancing about in my blouse like Millie's little ones now when she runs up the stairs. I love looking down at them. I was jumping up at the pepper trees and the white poplars pulling the leaves off and throwing them at him. He went to India. He was to write the voyages those men have to make to the ends of the world and back. It's the least they might get a squeeze or two at a woman while they can, going out to be drowned or blown up somewhere. I went up Windmill Hill to the flats that Sunday morning with Captain Rubios. That was dead spyglass like the sentry had. He said he'd have one or two from on board. I wore that frock from the Bimarché Paris and the coral necklace. The straits, shining. I could see over to Morocco almost. The Bay of Tangier, white in the Atlas Mountain with snow on it. And the straits like a river, so clear. Harry. Molly. Darling. I was thinking of him on the sea all the time. After at mass, when my petticoat began to slip down at the elevation, weeks and weeks, I kept the handkerchief under my pillow for the smell of him. There was no decent perfume to be got in that Gibraltar, only that chapeau de Spagne that faded and left a stink on you. More than anything else, I wanted to give him a memento. He gave me that clumsy clatter ring for luck that I gave Gardner going to South Africa or those boars killed him with their war and fever. But they were well beaten all the same, as if it brought its bad luck with it, like an opal or a pearl. Still, it must have been pure 18 karat gold because it was very heavy. I can see his face, clean-shaven. Free from the train again, weeping tone. Once in the dear dead days beyond recall. Close my eyes, breath, my lips, forward, kiss, sad look, eyes open. Piano. Air o'er the world the mists began. I hate that ists beg. Calms love sweet song. I let that out full when I get in front of the footlights again. Kathleen Kearney and her lot of squealers. Miss this, miss that, miss the other lot of sparrow farts skidding around talking about politics. They know about as much as my backside. Anything in the world to make themselves some way interesting. Irish homemade beauties. Soldier's daughter am I. I and who's are you? Bootmakers and publicans. I beg your pardon, coach. I thought you were a wheelbarrow. They die down dead, 
off their feet. If they ever got a chance of walking down the Alameda on an officer's arm like me, on the band night, my eyes flash. My bust that they haven't. Passion. God help their poor head. I knew more about men and life when I was 15 than they'll all know at 50. They don't know how to sing a song like that. Gardner said, No man can look at my mouth and teeth smiling like that and not think of it. I was afraid he might like my accent first. He's so English. Our father left me, in spite of his stamps. I had my mother's eyes and figure, anyhow. He always said, They're so snotty about themselves, some of those cads. He wasn't a bit like that. He was dead gone on my lips. Let them get a husband first that's fit to be looked at, and a daughter like mine, or see if they can excite a swell with money that can pick and choose whoever he wants, like Boylan to do it four or five times, locked in each other's arms. Or the voice, either. I could have been a prima donna. Only I married him. Comes love's old. Deep down, mm, chin, back, not too much. Take a double. Ah, my lady's bower is too long for an encore. About the moated grange at twilight and vaunted rooms. Yes, I'll sing Winds That Blow From The South that he gave after the choir stairs performance. I'll change that lace on my black dress to show off my bobs and I... Yes, by God, I'll get that big fan mended. Make them burst with envy. My hole is itching me. Always when I think of him, I feel I want to. I feel some wind in me. Ah, better go easy, not wake him. Have him at it again, slobbering. After washing every bit of myself, back, belly and sides. If we had even a bath itself, or my own room anyway. I wish he'd sleep in some bed by himself with his cold feet on me. Give us room even to let a fart. God, or do the least thing. Better, mm, yes, hold them like that. A bit on my side. Piano. Quietly. Sweet. There's that train. Far away. Pianissimo. One more song. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of The Colophon and our centennial reading of Ulysses from Thornwillow Press. Be sure to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts, and please consider supporting us by visiting our website, www.thornwillow.com. Your help makes this and all our endeavors possible.